but I welcome uh, everyone to uh, this uh, first panel on Saturday morning on Twin Peaks Day, which is great. Uh, this panel is about uh, locations uh, for filming uh, Twin Peaks uh, in the Los Angeles area. Uh, so we've got two experts here who can speak to um, locating some of those places and their various searches that they've gone through over the years to find out where some of our favorite uh, famous and infamous scenes of Twin Peaks have been filmed. So I have uh, with us uh, two, two great, great Twin Peaks fans, Josh Eisenstadt and Stephen Miller. So um, I guess we'll just start with generic and, uh, and ask you both uh, how you got kind of, you know, into searching for locations, I guess we'll say specifically in Los Angeles. Obviously we all know the good locations are here. Um, but Los Angeles uh, has some hidden secrets. Tell us about, okay. Tell us about that. Okay. So mine is kind of interesting. So we, this goes back to 1991 when I'm a little kid. And, you know, Twin Peaks was on, and I was probably way too young to watch it. But, you know, I always say, I, I didn't turn out crazy. So, you know, we're all good. But, uh, yeah, so I'm a small kid. Nobody in my school watched Twin Peaks, obviously. They all thought I was weird. And, uh, I didn't really know other Twin Peaks fans. I would try to convert my friends, but they were probably a little too young to be converted at that point. And I happened to be at, at an In-N-Out Burger, which is, uh, for those of you not on the West Coast, it's kind of a, a West Coast burger chain. And there was a person in front of me in line, and he was wearing a Have You Seen This Man Bob t-shirt. Many of you remember that shirt that they had in the early 90s. That, uh, that was one of the official pieces of merchandise. And so the guy, I see a guy doing that, and I'm thinking, wow, a Twin Peaks fan, somebody I can talk to. <laughs> so I go up to him, and I start saying, you're into Twin Peaks. And he's well, I was on the crew. And I thought, wow, I just met a crew member at Twin Peaks. This is amazing. <laughs> and so I asked him, um, you know, did you work on Fire Walk with me? Because this was before Fire Walk with me, it was hours after it was filmed. And he said, yes. I remember getting really excited. He tells me that, um, that he said, you're going to see Leland with, you know, the dark hair again instead of the white hair which I thought, okay, that makes sense. Good continuity, you know? And uh, then I tell him, I say, yeah, I said, you know, it's amazing, you know, up in Stokholmi, because I visited Stokholmi. I got my parents to take me there about six months before when the train car was still there, which was pretty amazing. That was really creepy in person. So I'm telling this guy about how I went up there and saw the train car, and, but I couldn't, I, you know, I couldn't find some of these spots. I couldn't find Easter Park. I couldn't find, you know, some of these. And he said, well, that's because they're right here. And I said, you're kidding me. There are locations in LA, I swear. And he said, well, we did a lot up in Malibu Lake. The gazebo, you know, Johnson's house, Tremont house. And so I went to my dad who was doing it time, and I said, there, and I said, can you drive me to Malibu Lake? <laughs> and that kind of began a long odyssey through the 90s to find everything. And I drove up to Malibu Lake and started finding a bunch of stuff because there was so much there. Now, most of it, unfortunately, burned down in the 2018 fire. But the Harold Smith and the Tremont house, Leo Johnson's house, it took me a long time to find the Lock Ladies Cabin, but eventually I did. That was up there too. That also burned down, which was extremely sad because to me, when that burned down, it was like the last kind of bit of Catherine in a weird way. It's kind of how it felt, and I know that's strange to say, but that is how it felt. But on a lighter note, I also found, you know, we also found the, uh, the interior of the book house and light after the veterinary clinic and all this stuff. And then I started asking actors, you know, the early Twin Peaks Festival of 94, where I first met John. And all these other places, I started going up to actors. And Stephen, I think they met in 96, 96. I started going up to actors and saying, where was the cemetery? Where was this? And some of their memories were a little on, some a little off. And, they, and I got the name Franklin Canyon from a few actors, or, you know, off Coldwater. And, and I would start driving around. And once I got my driver's license, big time driving around, trying to find the cemetery. And, and that was very difficult because I, I heard stuff like, well, it's up in, you know, La Crescenta, or Al Cadena. And it wasn't quite, it was Sierra Madre. So I started looking at every cemetery, but I was looking for those big, you know, stones that are behind Bobby, which were actually props. So that's what threw me. I actually went by the real one, and it took me a while to realize that that was it. And then Owl Cave, somebody said, you know, Bronson. So, and actually I think it was an actor that wasn't even in that scene that told me that. So it just became this search. And, you know, um, 
I'm trying to think you, I think you're trying to use that, uh, Frenchman Canyon, Stephen, you say that Frenchman Canyon is the Disneyland of Twin Peaks location. And it is, because they're all still present. You got Glastonbury Grove, you got all, all these spots in season two, Major Peaks disappears. In fact, where Major Peaks disappears, there's the big tree where Cooper goes to, you know, answer the call of nature. And at that big tree, if you turn around, it's the same tree from this angle where Don and James have their picnic. The last scene we have with James, other than, you know, the voiceover and the postcard, in episode 23 of season two. So that's kind of how I started with it. And uh, wanted to find everything. It took a while. We'll get to season three in a little bit, but that's a whole other story. Mm-hmm. That's awesome, Josh. And, and, and again, uh, you were finding these things, like, before Google Maps. Yeah, you know, there was no internet. None of the internet. For me, it was um, the gateway was infinitebeaks.com. And Charles mm-hmm. and Travis and Brad and you know they were beginning tracking this you know these locations and such. And so I remember in the late 2000s, I was on a business trip from Florida to California, and I stayed a couple extra days, and I used then literally printouts. I had created a PowerPoint slide of images um, and uh, like a presentation. And I remember going out to Franklin Canyon. I think the rock store may have been, that was Lidecker's Clinic, that may have been one of my first locations found, but then going through, you know, Malibu Lake, uh, Malibu Lake and then um, but Franklin Canyon was definitely, you know, and you, you go there and you just you find so many things. But, you know, and again, that, you know, in, that's kind of like an analog searching, you know. Yes. You, you literally are, are just piecing together like where things might be and then trying to match up using, you know, an image uh, from this. Uh, it certainly evolved, you know, over uh, time. And I think for me, it was um, just then after that, like 2008, 2009 period, I was going out and trying to find that, take little trips, you know, like California business and take a little extra time, you know, for that. Uh, but then later, when I launched the Peaks blog, uh, technology really helped, I think, with finding a lot of things. When it came to Google Street View and being able to do research on you know, property sites and you know, all that kind of stuff and trying to match up some stuff and, and find it. So, um, was there any, well, let me ask you this, was there any spot you haven't found yet? Is there anything that's missing that you're struggling to In LA. In LA. Here, yes. You know, and that would include all the way up through the return. Not in the third season. Not in the return. Okay. Okay. So it sounds like you guys have you have tapped out LA. You got it. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, Yes, there is one. Now there is one that's still unfound, and I've got some very good clues, and I have a pretty good idea where it is in an area that I can't access. But it's the one where uh, Wyndham Earl kidnapped Major Briggs on the horse costume. Now I was told that's, yeah. that's the one. Now I think I know where it is yeah. because Barry Vermillion gave a very good hint. Yes. And I went to that park yeah. by Whiteman Airport, which would make yeah. sense. But that park is it's not there. Yeah. But there's a back area that you can't access, yeah. and I'm thinking it's back there. Yeah. But originally, I'm pictures from outside the gate. Yes. Yeah. Thinking maybe I can match a tree. But, you know, yeah, I'm yeah. trying to figure out who I can contact to go through that gate yeah. and see if I can match the trees. But originally, I've spoken at different times to both Don Davis and Kenneth Welsh and asked them where that was, and they both said, find the Burbank Airport. It's a park by the Burbank Airport. So I went over to the Burbank Airport, so I all around checking out every possible park, and nothing was it. And then I found one that was a little bit away, and I thought, aha, there's hills behind it, that's got to be it. And I, then I worked on the uh, season two extras for the DVD set, and when we interviewed Stephen Gyllenhaal, he had mentioned that when he shot that scene, because he was the director of that episode, that Jake and Maggie Gyllenhaal's dad, and he mentioned that when he shot that scene, that it was really hard because there were buildings, and they have, if they moved the camera one a certain direction, they'd see buildings. So that was another hint. So I found a park that had no buildings, and I went there and I tried to match it up. I wanted it to be it so bad, and it wasn't. And then I think it might have been Brad that told me somebody come, I think, who was booking Barry Vermillion, uh, and he said something like uh, that Barry Vermillion said it was actually by Whiteman Airport. Now in that same episode, they filmed the scene of John Justice Weaver where Audrey, you know has her scene in the airplane. And, uh, Is your plane. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank God for that, yeah. <laughs> so that scene was the Whiteman Airport, which is uh, in the corner. And there's a park next to that. So uh, apparently Barry Vermillion had said there was a park right there. But well, like we were saying, it's a back area. And you know what, when I get back to LA, I gotta get on that. I gotta get on that, because I had a similar experience recently going to two Twin Peaks locations that are not accessible from the return. 
and it's because I was working on a film uh, that I was a part of the producer on, and I had to scout locations. And the location where Beulah's house is, and Richard Horn's Rock, which are both non-accessible, would have matched for this film. So I was able to do a legitimate location scout on both, and while I was there, asked them, could you take a picture of me for scale? <laughs> so I got a bunch of yeah. <laughs> so I got a bunch of pictures inside Beulah's and Richard, and standing on top of Richard's rock, pretending to be electrocuted. I don't know what they thought, but you know. But so, so. Uh, guys, I spent years. You'd spent years and years trying to locate the LA um, locations, and you pretty much feel at a certain point, you know, hey, success. And then there's this announcement that they're going to film Twin Peaks again, and very soon we know that they're filming obviously up here, but they're filming in LA. Uh, what was, uh, you know, just a quick personal note, when I heard Twin Peaks was coming back, I realized I was thrilled, and then I was also like, oh no. <laughs> There's a sort of obligation now that you, you have, to, have to start writing again about Twin Peaks. So I wonder, did you feel that same feeling of like, this is fantastic, and oh no, I've got to, I've got to go find these others. I, I remember the, uh, the original teaser, the one that showed all the locations, like it was just flashing, you know, it showed like share stations, you know, and I remember the, the fat trout, you know, and there's like a, a glimpse of it, and like, but that's not the fat trout, because that's not the one from, you know, Fire Me. It's like, where is that? And I remember just jumping on, like, you know, uh, Google Maps and trying to street view it, and end up finding it, you know, just you know, right down, right down North End. Um, but that was just like, it was a thrill, because it was like opening a whole new um, thing. But then getting into it more and more, yeah, there's just more, <laughs> there's just more it seems to find. And, and they, clearly the this, this story expanded, so you have other places that are not just Washington, but you also have Vegas and you have, and, and now when you try to find locations in California, it's, um, they're spread out so far. So you're not just going to Franklin Canyon and Malibu Lake, now you're going out to Palmdale, you know, you're going out to many other places around LA uh, that fit into these um, cities, you know, that, that are featured in the show. And so, for this, I'm going to tell something that I've never told before. Uh, I guess it's been enough time that's passed that I can. The season three location in LA became very easy to find for one reason. I was, uh, a little bit after it aired, I was doing, or right around the time it was airing, I think, I was just doing a Google search for things Twin Peaks and locations, and for some reason I came across a site that was accidentally there from a location scout on Twin Peaks that the address and scouting pictures of everything. Oh. It went down about maybe a week. I didn't tell anybody about it because it's, for obvious it's gold. <laughs> it's gold. Well, also because I didn't, you know, I knew it probably was, I didn't want to get into any trouble. Right on. But, um, yeah, that was there, and they were all there. Wow. Almost all there. Yeah. So it made it very easy. Otherwise, it would have been real quiet. Yeah. But the Snoqualmie ones, no such luck. But, you know. Uh, but those, you know, I got told by a lot of people where they were that were up here, you know, when, when the filming was going on. From a, from a location scouting perspective, I mean, how does that work for you? you know? Oh, how to find them? Yeah. Like, like just you know, like when you're working with film. Yeah, basically. I mean, a lot of it is, uh, nowadays, with all sorts of sites, and there's a lot of it now is done with these local sites like Peer Space and stuff like that. That's the way it's done a lot now. These sites where you find locations, you go up there, check what you're looking for, the area you're looking for it in, and, you know, hundreds of results come up, and you pick what you want. The way it used to be done back in the day is you have location libraries. And yes, I went into those in the 90s. <laughs> trying to find Evelyn Marsh's house. Oh, yeah. That one was difficult because I, it looked to me like Pasadena. It's not, it happens to be the location closest to where I live. It's in Encino, but, uh, and it was Don Davis told me it was a house in Encino, and then and I said to Don Davis, how do you know where we filmed Evelyn Marsh's house? He said, because they also filmed the scene with me sitting on that chair in the woods at the same house. So if you see that scene where Major, you know, at the beginning of episode 20, Major Briggs is sitting there, he's recounting his disappearance, and he's sitting on what looks like a kind of a throne in the woods. That is also, Evelyn Marsh's house, the location of. So a lot of people joked that that was the White Lodge, and said, you know, so Evelyn Marsh's house was the White Lodge. <laughs> yeah, uh, so some of the locations, I think maybe from the first original uh, series, 
those locations appear in other productions as well, too. Is that right? Like some of the things you, I mean, do you find when you're watching a movie or a television show and you go, oh, that, that, that's good piece? Actually, from season three, okay. um, the recent Muppets, the thing, uh, the one, the Muppets show on Disney Plus, that was uh, the Dr. Teeth, you know, Electric Mayhem, there is scenes that they shot out on, um, the spot where Mr. C is driving through the desert and, and crashes, and I, I remember stopping and like pausing my wife and said, "That's that's the spot. I've been you know I've been there showing her pictures and matching it up and stuff." But yeah, they use that same kind of uh, uh, spot from that. So yeah, occasionally it'll pop up. And your wife just tolerates you, right? And I'm speaking from experience. Too. So, yeah, you know, she, uh, like, oh, good for you. Katie, uh, Katie. Because what happens a lot of times, um, I get fixated on like trying to find some. I think of the, the zone, so the scene of the zone. And I had heard that it was in some place. And, and so when searching and using Google Earth and Google Maps and Street View and so forth, I had probably worked on that trying to find it. Just to get through, just hearing this, or looking in this area, looking in that area, um, probably a good six months before. And then I was literally just scrolling on uh, Google Maps, like an aerial view, and I saw the two shipping containers that are like there, and it's just like, that has to be it. And you scroll down, and you know, and you start piecing together, you start thinking about, okay, well, the proximity of things, you know. So I mean, the car wash in the casino, you know, was another one where it's like, well, if you're on a production and you're you're gonna have to move the crew, that's a production. Like you gotta pack up everything and move stuff over. It'd be so much easier if it was close by, and that way. And then it's sort of piecing together, going, okay, well that makes sense to be able to go from this location to this location. We're trying to capture all of it. Maybe we'll just one day shoot, and they don't have to drive super far. Yeah. You know, and, and that it's interesting to hear you say that because um, I've seen interviews with some of the people behind the scenes, and they talk about that very thing about how. You are trying to expedite and make this as simple as possible. And it helps you, at least for me it does, it helps you kind of get into the mindset of what it's like to have made Twin Seeps. And um, you, you get, it, I think, an appreciation for uh, for the production yeah, that way. And I've worked on, like, for work, you know, I've worked on production, like, video stuff and video editing. And I know, like, and these are smaller things. I can only imagine a television show or a film or whatnot and just the amount of crew, and so you're trying to maximize the days, because you are only gonna shoot for 40 days, let's say, and you've gotta capture it all, and you're trying, and so that, that is, you get into the mindset of like, well, how did they, where would they have done that? And you start narrowing the search down, and then it, it, you piece it all together. Or like they said, turning you know, something, where all of a sudden you get it from a different angle, that happens so much out in a lot of you, you know, where yeah. again, you just turn the camera and like, oh, it's a completely different part of the woods, but literally it's, Five steps over. Right? <laughs> it just seems like it's there. Yeah, like Cooper. Like, yeah, like Cooper uh, where Laura meets Cooper in Part Seventeen is literally right by the parking lot, and then you turn around, you got the "I'm not your foot" right over there, and it's just like you know everything it's is. Right down. But, it, but the crew. I mean, again, you're you're trying to maximize the time um, yeah. because you're on a budget and you don't want to go over budget. Yeah. So again, you, but you get into that mindset. So, um, I, I'm going to ask you about a specific scene. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say one thing, Katie, because time really is money in filming, and every time you pack up and move, you're losing maybe three hours, two to three hours in that pack up and that move. So if you're going an hour away, you're costing your crew another hour, and you're getting less shots. So I'm, I'm interested in um, in scene three, uh, Rancho Rosa, that neighborhood. Um, I'm sure you guys have been. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. is, is it in fact pretty much abandoned or not, not, not anymore. anymore? Was it was it when they filmed? Yes. It was. Yes. So talk yeah. a little bit about that. Well, yeah. 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 When I, I first went out there right after and we should just say, you know, I'm sure you'll remember but where yeah. Dougie first appears in the empty house and then the, the, the mother and son were across the street and the exploding column all. So when I first went there, it was when I think it was like after part five air, around that time, where it was the scene that John was talking about with the exploding car. And it was exactly the same. The house was empty, it was a for sale sign. The uh, the, uh, Dougie, the Dougie Jade house was empty. 
Uh, the 119 house wasn't, and it looked exactly like what you've seen. Now, I went back there about six months ago, and the 119 house now is all built up and looks nice. It no longer has that look. It, it's brass. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's been totally changed. Yeah. So, yeah, it used to be, but you know what looks the same still, other than the red door, is Lancelot Court. Uh, now, is that close by? Is that in the same area? That's out, out in the New Hall, Stevenson Ranch area, and that is about a couple blocks away from the uh, a big property called New Hall Land Farms. And on that property is the Frogmont House, and where the gas station from Part 8 used to be, but no longer is. I don't know why they tore it down, but they did. Which is really unfortunate because a while back I drove past and the gate was open, but I couldn't find the Frogmont House, and, but, and the gas station wasn't there. And when I went uh, out, to, it's in the Palm, you know, Palmdale, you know, out, out that way uh, for the Ranch Rose thing. Uh, it was probably in 2020, so it was during COVID, so not a lot of people on the roads. <laughs> and and the property still looked the same. So the welcome sign, you know, it's the Ranch Rose for the and so forth. Um, that area, uh, Vinny um, uh, had been recently visited, and there's houses there. So it, when I was there, it was still empty. Um, okay. And the same goes with the. Um, trying to shoot Jay through the throat. There was, uh, that was empty still at that time. Well, I'm pretty sure it's still up. Yeah. yeah. yeah they really built up around yeah. Rosa. So, you know, we watch these scenes when we're watching it on television. Obviously, they bring in production crew and set dressers and they, and they decorate the the actual location. Are you sometimes disappointed when you get there and you're like, this is just, this is just nothing. There's nothing here. And without all of that set decoration, it kind of takes away a little of the magic. Beulah's house, the interior of Beulah's house. The interior of Beulah's house is just an empty shed. So the outside looks exactly the same and was great, but the interior was like, you know, where's that jar with those weird things, you know, things on it? Where's the, you know, where are the chairs? And it's just this empty, and they built a wall in Beulah's house. They constructed, where Otis is sitting, they constructed a wall that's not actually there. And that's so the Ray and Daria come out from back there. It's really just a, a square. And I can show people pictures if you want to see that I took, that I have on my phone. So you can see what it looks like in real life. And I'm going to give us, uh, I'm going to do those very vlog. Yeah, so uh, you'll see those. And then there's, you know, there's some of them that just would have been impossible to find, I think, like Warden Murphy's house. That one, you know, without knowing the address would have been, that's out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Because you can't get that on Street View. <laughs> they don't have access to it. And so I was looking everywhere for it, you know, but it, unfortunately you just, and, and even here in, um, back in, the, you know, in Street View, they, they only had um, real crude images from Snohomie Valley area from up 2008. And the, and the Google Maps cameras were really bad quality at that time. Mm -hmm. So they've since enhanced and you certainly have a lot, but again, it's a matter of the cars driving around and capturing the footage. Um, but it was, it was difficult for a time trying to find, and once you come out here and then see it, and, and it does start to look different. And in one way, it's nice from a preservation of history, right? So that you have, and you can look at time periods, you know, through stuff. Even Google Earth does the same thing. You can go back in time to see when things maybe changed, you know, like the gas station got demolished. You can see on the, on the, on the satellite view, okay, it was here in October this year, and then it was gone in by January. So somewhere in that time, you can start to discern exactly when things changed. And that's the one thing, I think, as the original episodes in season one and two, I mean, it's 35 years, and things yeah. change, you know, and I think that trying to preserve that and capture those moments and, and, and that, but having the technology now, to be able to do it, it only goes back so far, you know, so it's a, uh, without finding these things right away right now, you can lose, you can lose them because it's completely changed and everything where they are. That's why it's like almost a rush. Yeah. And I just thought of actually, to go back to a question you asked earlier, John, I just thought of two more from the first two seasons in LA that have yet remained unfound, that I came very, very close and I thought I found a few times. So I got one clue back in the 90s that none of it, I went up to the, uh, the public parks area of Mount of Lake and I said, do you know if anything the Twin Peaks was filmed here? They said nothing in Twin Peaks was filmed on public land. So like, okay, that was a big clue. So the two other scenes, or well, three scenes that I never found in LA, and I don't know if you have to tell me if you have, they are, um, and I know where the two of them are. It's the one where Bernard Renault's body is by the tree where, where Ben meets Leo. And I know from Richard Beamer that was in Malibu Lake. Uh, I know it was somewhere there, and where James and Donna, you know, where they buried the necklace in episode four, not the one up here, but the one there. Now I know that's the same property, I just don't know where that is. And for years, 
I've searched everywhere, and the only thing I can figure is it's got to be somebody's backyard and private property. That's the only thing I can figure, and whether that got burned down in the fire and is lost forever, I don't know. Whether I'll ever find those two, I don't know. And the other one is the, what's supposed to be the exterior of the Palmer House, where James chases Don in episode 10, and yells, Donna, yeah. why? Yeah. Man, yeah. I find for that too. I cannot find those it. are the other ones. So if anybody ever finds it, please, Email me, contact me, you can find me on Facebook, message me, message Stephen, we want to know. But that, you know, see, th th this goes to one thing. Now we know that that was probably going to be near where the Donna Cemetery scene is. Now the Donna Cemetery scene, I would assume, is going to be the same cemetery up in Sierra Madre. However, maybe it's not. It might not be, because you can't really tell. There's nothing that identifies it as the same location. It literally could be anywhere. And those are the other ones that have, I guess, eluded all of us. So you, obviously you have various barriers to overcome when you're looking for these things, like um, it might be on private property or you, um, you know, just trying to find it. Do you, have you ever encountered people who make you a little nervous about, or are not happy that you're there? Have you, have you encountered, have you had? I, I, I have not. Okay, uh, yeah, because I, I not. you know, they're like, what are you doing here? <laughs> Actually, the big one is here, at the private Portland airport. Strangely enough, that's the big one. And that is the airport in Fire Walk With Me, where we see Lil and uh, yeah. Jack Desmond and, and uh, Gordon Cole. Exactly, yeah. That one, um, the guy there, yeah, was not happy. And, you know, we, we're not on the property, but when you pull up to that gate, I wouldn't recommend it. I heard that one year he came up with a shotgun. I didn't witness that, but somebody went there and that happened. So I always tell people, I recommend not going anywhere close to that. Uh, in L.A., you know, I found most of these as a kid, so most people aren't going to scream and be mean to a kid. So that kind of helped. And, you know, I also did it for other Lynch films. And I mean, because I was a kid, I got very lucky. I mean, people let me inside their houses. I got inside Pete Dayton's house in Lost Highway. I got inside, you know, Andy's house, the party house in Lost Highway. I got, you know, uh, into the whole courtyard at Aunt Ruth's apartment. Uh, all these things, just because, you know. And did the people usually know about that the shooting took place there, and they were aware of it, or are they sometimes themselves like, wow, I didn't realize, you know. Sometimes they don't know. Most of the time they do, but sometimes they don't. And uh, But, you know, I remember it was sometimes when I would do it like, right after the film would come out, it'd be the same people. I mean, one of the, I know it's totally off topic, but the Blue Velvet locations, I went there in 97, and that one was real interesting, because everybody remembered it, not been that long. And yeah, there's just, but I, don't, I won't go off topic. But there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting ones from that experience, including being in Beaumont's hardware store, talking about it to the people who are working there, and then literally on the radio, the song Blue Velvet comes on. That really, and I have that on, I have that recorded on high eight, and it was so strange. Uh, I remember uh, going to um, Chili John's, uh, which is in Park Eight, yeah. and I the camera and I got my Twin Peaks hat on, you know, and I show up and this is during COVID times, so they were doing only to-go orders. Um, but I come up and the guy thought I was like a location scout, you know, kind of thing. I said, no, I'm just a super fan of Twin Peaks, you know, and he's like, oh, well, come on inside, you know, and like, let me come in and take pictures and, you know, and it was really damn fun chilly too. <laughs> it was, it was nice. I ate it in the car, as, uh, but uh, they, were, they were very friendly, you know, but again, he thought I was just like LA, you know, Looking for the next uh, location stuff. Most of the time, the folks are pretty, pretty friendly and cooperative. Almost yeah. always. Yeah. And a lot of times, there's certain ones like the Eat It Rudy's, aka Eat It Judy's. Yeah. I mean, they've completely embraced it. Like when, last time I was there, they had like. Oh, there. Yeah. It's, it's the image for image from my blog. Yes, it's yeah. yeah. It's, it, uh, it, so I went in again back in September 2020 to eat. Um, uh, Rudy's, and it was just down the street. My um, always parents were in Irvine for a couple of years, um, working the, the college there. And I remember just going out and took a bunch of pictures, wrote an article about it. But then, yeah, they actually printed out an image that I created as the feature image of the article. That's like, yeah, it's a banner. <laughs> you 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 were big time. They yeah, made big like, time. Like, you were really on your you know, like, yeah, But you go in there, and it's like it feels like the you know the scene. I mean, it, it, you know, and it, it was good and good copy. And in fact, they even they even laugh if you order deep fried guns and ask if it's on the menu. <laughs> it's on the menu now. It 
is a butt. It is a They should put it on there. Yeah. Yeah. But I actually asked for two five guns and they laughed and got the reference. That was so great. Uh -huh. All right. Well, uh, let's open it up. If there's anyone out here who might have any questions uh, for, for our panelists about LA locations. Anyone you want to know about specifically? Anything like that? Other than I can certainly ask you about it. We've got the big. Um, Oh, we got one. That gentleman, I recognize he's, he's a Twin Peaks fan. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, of the LA locations I visited, uh, you know, for me it was like, oh, this is the Back Cave, for example. Oh, yeah. Um, is there any one particular of the LA locations that you would call out as used in the most other media properties? Mm, good question. Um, I mean, the I back thing is definitely, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. fronts and, you know, which it, you walk around the corners, so like where they, the, 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 the car, cars are parked out back, you literally walk around the corner, like, oh, there's a the Hollywood sign. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And I got a, uh, at the time I was with uh, someone out there, and I first time visiting it, and she was laughing because here I am taking pictures of the cave and the Hollywood sign. Right there. And there's, a, there's a photo of me, and I'm just like turned this way, but yet Hollywood's over here. And I was just so engrossed with the back of this cave. <laughs> but but again, it was Al Cave. I mean, yeah. like, after so many years I've seen that and to, to go to it. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, I've seen that pop up in so many films. I, I would say that that is the one that is used the most. I mean, even the last time I went up there, they were filming when I went up there. I mean, it's just, it's constantly used. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that's used a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah, American Horror Story is set up for uh, Friends and Canyon. I think they shot the entire thing there. And also, see, another, here's another interesting thing, okay? So, Franklin Canyon, if you're looking at Glastonbury Grove, where they filmed Glastonbury Grove, if you turn around directly and face the opposite way where the camera was, that's where Wyndham Earl's cabin was built. Which I find really interesting because Wyndham Earl's cabin is literally, if you walk out, you're facing Glastonbury Grove. He's looking for the black lot. He's right there! Right there! <laughs> so, uh, this is, I, I don't know what the answer to this is, but you know, I read an article uh, years and years ago about someone returned the Jedi out in the desert and they built Jabba's sand barge. And people go out there decades later with metal detectors and they find portions of the, the you know, their, their treasures. I got a piece of it because when they took it all down and blew up, you know, pieces got scattered into the skin. Have you ever found pieces of sets or any set dressing when you've gone, and for any of it, including season three? Okay. Dead Dog Farm. That was one of my favorite locations and that was torn down in about 2000, 2001 in there. Uh, that was an abandoned house on the property of Olive View Hospital. And it literally, there was a bunch of abandoned houses, and another one was the one where Dick Tremaine's changing his tire. So those two houses were out there. They're all gone now. But Dead Dog Farm was literally boarded up, and I went out there with a couple friends of mine that were big Twin Peaks fans, somewhere around 98, 99. And because it was boarded up an abandoned house, and I know we shouldn't have done this, but my friend said, I can pick this lock. <laughs> So, I said, you gotta do what you gotta do. We gotta do what we gotta do. I said, it's fun. I'm like, they're probably gonna tear this down. It's an abandoned house. We gotta do it. And we go in there and we get to, you know, see where, you know, Cooper's sitting, you know, by that radiator and John Renault gives him that great speech, which is a scene I love, by the way. And that's, uh, people talk about that section of season two, not really liking it, but you have brilliance like that in there. That is you, brought, you brought them that guy with you. Exactly, exactly. And maybe the nightmare would die, would be, yeah, that whole thing. So we got to see that, and then when I went back and it was torn down, there were pieces of it. So I grabbed a piece of Dead Dog Farm, <laughs> which I still have. And also, when I was in Wilmington, North Carolina, the, the slow club had just burned down, the interior. And I went to where that was, and there was a piece of that. So I have a piece of the slow club and a piece of Dead Dog Farm. Oh, yes, and so the Harold Smith and the Tremont House, if you remember the scene in episode 13 where James and Donna, Maddie's pulling away in the car, they, they, uh, they just escaped from, you know, Harold Smith, well not really escaped, they weren't going to do anything if they were scared he was. They ran out and then, you know, the, the dialogue with the, he had a slower secret diary, he could have killed her. You know, he could have killed both of us, pretty stupid, huh? That whole scene. You can see the mailbox, this kind of big, distinct mailbox in the background. Well, after it all burned down, all that was left was that mailbox. 
So there's a friend of mine who's right around my birthday, happened to be driving by Battle of the Lake, told me that they were taking that mailbox and about to throw it in the dumpster. Or they did throw it in the dumpster. And he talked to the people, I guess, who might have owned it or something. They said, are you throwing that out? And they said, yeah. And he said, do you mind if I take it? I have a friend that would go nuts for this as a birthday present. And they said, we don't care. We're throwing it out. Take it. So I have the, uh, the, the Harold Smith tree on mailbox now. That's the other one. I guess that is a piece of wood. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's archaeology. It's yes. set archaeology. <laughs> exactly. Uh, maybe we'll, maybe get a little bit too into this stuff. But, well, you, know. you know what? We're among friends, right? Exactly. <laughs> I can only imagine what this would sound like to the outside world. But in this world, you know, we all understand, right? Right. right. Our obsessions. Yeah, every, right. You know, I had a friend we can relate. I had other friends that are not going to teach people that wrote, you know, there for my birthday. And they see me, like, jumping up and down with that. And they'll keep me like, okay, I know that you're weird with that stuff. But, uh, <laughs> you're jumping them down over a mailbox. <laughs> Uh, anybody else out here have any questions or comments? Um, uh, yell them out if you do. I mean, if it's something you prefer to speak. Yeah, right there. Could you describe the inside of Owl Cave? Because we've never been able to go it in. And it's all fenced off right? now. Yeah. I, so the inside, um, it has this glow. It was like this white glow because of the light coming from like you know um, either side of the entranceway. And the scene really would have set up like basically the the whole action that you know the whole turning of the thing and so forth. Um, was close to the side where um, the cars are parked and, uh, there. Um, but literally it's just like carved out rock, you know, and there's like a little piece over here. It's it's not really tall, you know, from that, but it's just I just remember this glow on either side uh, it's coming in from, from from the outside. But it's it, that scene where the whole thing crumbles, that, that was all going to set out. You know, um, but you can see kind of where that would have been. Um, you know. yeah. And also, what's interesting is when uh, Carl was mentioning that it's off the Bat Cave, what's interesting is when you walk up, you have to walk up a little bit of a hill to get there because you can't access that unless you're filming, they block it off. And when you walk up, the first thing you see is the Bat Cave entrance. That's what you see first. Yeah. You have to walk around to the back, and there's two entrances there. The first one you come to, which the last one was there now has a gate in front of it, is the, well, unfortunately, is the Owl Cave entrance. But the other entrance to the left of that, when you go through there, to your left, there, that's where they filmed the, uh, the, uh, the symbols and all of that. But clearly they would have put a false wall in front of that wall in order to make that fall and do all of that stuff. But what I find interesting, has anybody noticed that that shot that ends episode 25 when Wyndham Earl does the symbol inverted and he turns it and the wall falls, has anybody noticed the similarity of that shot to the waterfall? Yeah. And, we're, and I asked Wayne Dunham about that and he said, I said, was that intentional? Because he directed that episode? And he said, yes. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Just a side note. So, and when we say back game for anyone out there who, who might be too young, um, <laughs> it's the 1960s yes. Adam West Batman yes. television yes. show where the Batmobile came flying out. Yeah. No, 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 no. Um, yeah. So, I, I just, as a quick aside, when you go up there, I don't know how many times you've been, but I imagine there's still people who are like, I'm there to see the back cave. Yeah, yeah. 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 They're, 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 that show made a huge impact on the culture back in the 60s. Yeah. Bats on one side, owls on the other. <laughs> okay, there you go. That's why I was telling Excellent. Okay. Um, again, just yell out if you've got something. Um, I'm going to, we've got a few more minutes. So I'm curious about the Lucky Seven office building. Uh, oh, yes. I, I, you know, written about it. Um, I know that there is a sculpture in front of it and that when they shot season three, for whatever reason, I can only speculate, um, Lynch covered this sculpture that's outside the Lucky Seven building with a uh, fabric and then attached red balloons to it. Uh, um, and you, do you know the, you know the reason why? I do. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The copyright kind of thing? Or? Exactly, yeah. They, they tried to get, yeah. they tried to get permission from the sculptor and they couldn't get it. So basically they would have had a copyright suit if they filmed that, so that was the only option was to cover that. It was a total copyright issue, and the, and the statue that, you know, with the uh, man pointing the gun was put there for production that's not actually there, right. and that was modeled after David Lynch's father. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so much we talked a little bit about during the props panel is that, again, it's the, the rights, right? You know, and so and somebody owns the copyright to something, and if they don't grant the rights, then you're infringing upon their, their yeah. copyrights. Uh, exactly. Everything has to be clear, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, it just speaks to, I guess, the genius uh, of David Lynch that, uh, you know, one of my favorite stories, I'm sure you know, a little lot topic, but uh, they're going to go shoot a uh, scene in Lost Highway and it had rained, 
And the winch is, uh, they're saying, it rained, it was dry before, and he says, just get some extras out there with hoses, you know, and they're playing a game, and that's why it's wet now. And so he, he improvises fast, and he can make it work for him, and, and it, it, he did in that particular case with the lucky setting, he puts that fabric in the red balloons, and all of a sudden it takes on this um, potent connotation that it means something else, and so, uh, yeah. It is, however, quite noticeable when you're, when you're watching it. But so the, so the Lucky Seven office building is a lot. Obviously, we talked about the uh, the, the, um, the man holding the gun, which is uh, that was added. But then there's also Zynon's, um Bakery that's right there in the near the front door. And uh, is that is that just something? I mean, like, is there a bakery there and they just yeah. renamed it? Yeah. Okay. It's a little cafe that's actually there that they just renamed. That's for the uh, because it actually is kind of a corporate office building. And also the but the interiors other than that lobby were filmed at the LA Times building. Yeah which I was still waiting to get a chance to scout as a location, which hopefully soon, because that also has a Duncan Todd's office, I in addition. Really nice, like the wooden suites and uh, Exactly, yeah, so I'm hoping one day to be able to get in there. But if you have to do so, it's, kind of, it's two different locations. Yeah, that. yeah, very interesting. And also about what you were saying, I have another kind of, yeah. a little bit of a topic table story that's kind of like the one you told John about Lost Highway. Um, this one comes from Jeremy Alter, who was a producer or co-producer on Inland Empire, and was a location scout, or location, uh, assistant location manager on Lost Highway. And he told the story that they found the location for Sheila's house. If you remember the scene where Pete Dayton pulls up, and Sheila comes out and gets in the car. And it's just one shot, and it's right near where they filmed Pete Dayton's house. So they scouted the location, they picked it, they picked it at day by daytime. They go to film, David and sees the house at night, says, it's not right. That's not it. It looked better by day, that's not it. So he says, well, okay, David, let's drive and find where you want to film. It's the night they're filming. So he drives around all over the neighborhood and finally finds the house. That's it, right there. That's the location I want. So he tells Jeremy, Jeremy, I want you to go up to the door and ask them if we could film Natalie Wood's daughter walking out of their house. So Jeremy's, okay, David. He goes up to the door, knocks on the door, says that, and they say, of course. So they bring Natasha Gregson and Wagner down there. She comes out of the door and you have your scene. So it's one of those things that David Lynch improvising. It's not what he saw in his, you know, it's not what he saw the right way. And then he said, you know what? We're going to find something else in the neighborhood. And there you go. So we know from when they shot the pilot up here and other stories that when Lynch is on location, he often befriends um, the people who either run or own some of the um, locations. We know. Obviously, um, Mary Weber made an impression on him, and he puts her into the, the return. And then we were talking just about the pilot, the, the, the gentleman who ran the Keanu Lodge. Yes, uh, Bob Reedy. He puts into the pilot. Uh, do you uh, encounter people who remember uh, working or um, uh, interacting with Lynch and some of the stories they oh, yeah. share? I mean, that are, I imagine. I imagine most of them are you know, thrilled that it happened. And really thrilled. Another one that's kind of not as known, too, is that the uh, the new Fat Trout trailer park over there, the owner of that is a man named Bill O'Dell, and David Lynch, he's the guy that's on the crutch, uh, uh, kind of walking with the cane. He's plays Chris Cole, the guy, which is a scene David Lynch added in because he likes his look so much. He owns the new Fat Trout trailer park. Do you remember the scene where Carl Rod, you know, Harry Dean Stanton's walking out and he says, you know, stop selling your blood? That's the owner of the new Fat Trout trailer park in real life. And he just loved his look and put him in it. And it's something that he does all the time. And obviously, so it's, it's uh, and yeah, everybody usually does. I mean, the people that were there are always remembered. And it's, yeah, it's always positive. Yeah, so when you were like down at the diner to eat, uh, eat at Rudy's, I mean, they must have some recollection of having Lynch there. And, um, oh, yeah. I mean, they're, 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 those folks are kind of fortunate because they get an opportunity to get close to Lynch because they're giving of their own locations and and you know, would, would it be great if Lynch came up to our house yes. <laughs> and we have a chance yes. to like talk to him yes welcome to him won't charge him anything <laughs> so I, I you guys you're documenting locations but you're also documenting experiences too which I think is really valuable and helps us all understand a little more about his art and how he approaches the story is told about finding a new house um, and then the people you encounter along the way who can who can give you 
stories about that. Well, and, and for me, the work that I do from a location perspective, I also want to get just grounding from a historical perspective. So if you think about these are places that exist in people's everyday lives, you know, they're, they're going by them each day, and there's sometimes a long history in that and kind of plays in. And there's, you know, unique connections and things that happen, you know, about, oh, they picked this location, they probably didn't realize it was this, but then and somehow there's that synchronous thing that happens, you know, like, like hearing Blue Velvet. You stay yeah, yeah. in the hardware store. It's so, so weird. It keeps happening. Yeah. It really keeps happening. Vicky, we have um, really only five minutes left, and I know that the next location, oh, question, yeah. great, yeah. excellent, go ahead. What, um, you mentioned some of the LA locations you guys have found. How about uh, around here? Any, oh, oh, yes, okay. We discussed the airport. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the ones we haven't found out here. Okay, we, we talk, we, Steve and I have talked about this one before. The big one. Well, there's two big ones, two huge ones. The Log Ladies Cabin wide exterior shot that's also used in season three. The one they used in Malibu Lake that I mentioned, yes. it's in episode five, it's only when, you know, Hawk, uh, Truman, and Cooper come around the corner and see the Log Ladies, just my log is not judging all that. And the interior, that was in Malibu Lake, that's the one that burned down, but the wide shot is gotta be somewhere up here, and it would have been shot by Ron Garcia when they were shooting, you know, second unit. That is yet to be found. Uh, there are a lot of us that have been searching for literally decades, yeah. and it's not been found. And the other one is not, there's a different exterior of Harold Smith that you see in Fire Walk with me. That one, we also have not found. Could that one have been filmed in LA? The interior of Harold Smith's was filmed in LA. Yeah, the interior was a set. Yeah, for, for both, and you notice that it's flipped in Fire Walk with me. Yeah. Is that from where? It's a different couch, too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, Harold redecorated. <laughs> yeah, he redecorated in those two days. Right? Exactly. He has somebody come in and say, you know, Laura says she's not going to be she doesn't want you to come back to me never. I'm going to get a decorator here. We're going to flip this whole thing. Uh, we live inside of here. Exactly. exactly. Um, um, okay, we have another panel in five minutes. So uh, I, I think we have to go to another location. So I want to give everyone time if they want to go there. I'm going to here. Uh, thanks for um, coming out, and we have a few more minutes, so yeah, thank, um, more than welcome. So we're going to be hanging out here for a few minutes. If you got anything you want to just chat with us about, uh, we'd love to talk to you some more, and then uh, we'll see you down the road. Thanks for coming. Thank you.